In many respects, today's TV universe would be virtually inconceivable to most viewers watching TV in the 1970s, which is when our next speaker began to make an indelib indelible mark on the medium by telling great stories that had real social impact. Norman Lear is going to sit down with Ted Sarandos, who's also making an impact and paving the way for the new golden age of storytelling. To set the stage for this conversation, let's take a look at some true gems from our Paley collection featuring the great Norman Lear. Thanks for coming on our show, Mr. Lear. Please, Bob, it's, uh, it's Norman. No, no, when I address the man who owns the industry I work in, I say Mr. <laughs> What is new with the new series? Well, we've studied the quotients, ratings, and audience percentiles for Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh. and the consensus is to set this new series there. Good, good. Now, it's got all the characters you ordered. The father is a union organizer. A union organizer. The mother is his boss, mm. the president of a large steel company. Mm. But the father is proud, and they live on his money. Mm -hmm. Now, the daughter is a nun and their son is a gay state trooper. <laughs> Tell me, does it have a twist? A twist? Sure. They're all practicing snake handlers. <laughs> practicing snake handlers? There is a sense of family in the Lear factory, even at All in the Family, now in its fifth season. Despite contract disputes and public wrangling, the affection between Lear and his players is apparent. Is, is, is this a phony sense of family here, or do you people... It's a very phony, it's a very phony sense. This is, this is just phony. <laughs> what gives you the most pleasure in being Norman Lear? I had a trip recently. And, uh, and it was the only nighttime trip that I've taken in, in a great many years, and so perhaps that's why the thought occurred to me only this one time. And to look down at America at night and see lights everywhere and wonder, is it just possible, after all those thousands of uh, half hours and all of those years and the fact that they're playing so much in syndication, that wherever there is a light, there's somebody that something, some part of me, helped to laugh. I, I love that thought. I love it. Please welcome to the stage Norman Lear and Ted Sarandos. Ah, got it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's the first time people stood up when I walked into a room. I think that's for you. Well, let, let me tell you, it started when I turned 90. Yeah. Me too. I, I can take a deep breath and get applause now. <laughs> After 90, everything changes with them, not with you. Not with you, you the feel same. the same, yeah. We, so I had, uh, this was like one of these uh, good news, bad news things. The good news is you're, you're going to sit with God. The bad news is you got 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to, uh, in this quick 30 minutes, uh, I'm going to skip. We're going to sit with God wherever <laughs> she is. <laughs> so we'll skip, uh, I think we'd skip childhood. Okay. You, and, and I encourage everyone who hasn't to pick up the book because it is a fantastic read and you'll burn right through it and, and read it again. Um, and I want to go right to the heart of where you were in the 70s with uh -huh. television. And at your peak, I turned this out last night, 120 million Americans watched Norman Lear's television shows every single week. Wow. Wow. Right? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Now, which means that you had a view of America that, uh, and a voice of America that very few people either had any control to or any insights into. And I, I was curious, what do you think shaped your view of America in the 70s more than anything in your history? I have to go back to my childhood. Oh, good, let's do it. Let's do it then. Let's go right back there. Uh, I can see a, 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 
a clear through line is, uh, now I want to say love of country, but I want to say in love, yeah. because uh, we all love our country. Uh, I don't question the next guy's patriotism. I don't have to wear a flag pin to prove mine. Yeah. Uh, but we were at a time before World War II, uh, we had civics classes in public schools. We learned about what uh, the Bill of Rights, the Declaration, the Constitution meant to us. Uh, and we were in love with all of that. Then came a war in which we were so clearly, totally the good guys. And, uh, and we rose to an impossible occasion. I mean, that we could win that war given our circumstance and the Axis circumstance at that time was just magical. And everybody, came together to, to get that done. Uh, and then we concluded World War II and instigated the Marshall Plan and, uh, and helped Europe get back on its feet. And uh, a word I don't use that often, nobody seems to use that often. We were splendid. All of that was splendid. splendid. Now, somebody had to help us understand shortly after that don't take yourself too seriously, guys. You're human beings who did some good work and you earn a great deal of credit, but you, that doesn't make you God's chosen. You are just another version of everybody else and a struggling country uh, with promises you haven't kept yet. And I think we forgot all that and we were just behaving as though we were God's chosen. And, uh, and got way off track. So it's interesting well, that your shows were considered by many to be critical of, of American values and critical of what was happening, and, uh, and yet you're, you come at it with, this very, with a great sense of idealism about the country and its people. Well, I, uh, you know, I, my bumper sticker reads, just another version of you. Yeah. So we are versions of each other, and uh, I love us. <laughs> but. Do we make mistakes? Are we, we have a tendency to overdo everything. Right. You know, when, uh, when uh, a woman by the name of Beryl Virtue came to me with a show from England called Till Death Us Do Part, they had made eight episodes. And uh, they were going to make another eight episodes for a second season, and that was it. The minute I said, let's do All in the Family. We were making 24, 26, I don't remember, episodes a year. And, uh, you know, I think over time, uh, the establishment, not Americans, Americans are flock, we are all. I feel myself to be uh, just part of the flock. I need my leadership. I need a president who sees the world in a grander way than I do, understands things I don't understand. And uh, uh, we need to be led, and we're not, we're not led well. The, and I'm not talking about the president, I'm talking about the media, I'm talking yeah. about uh, the uh, chemical companies, I'm talking and, about. And you know, in the, in the Times, um, there were, the, to the illustration we saw earlier, where the concentration of storytelling, the concentration of storytellers right. was incredibly high. There were three networks. Um, John, Johnny Carson was a voice. Uh, Walter Cronkite was a voice. Your, your shows that 120 million people are watching every week were a voice that kind of unified things. Is it tougher to lead in, a, in the world that we're living in today? Well, it's tougher to lead in a certain way. Showrunners tell me that they'd like to deal with some of the problems on the networks. Yeah. Uh, some of the problems we dealt with and can't, despite the fact that we did it 35 and more years ago. Uh, they can't deal with impotence, abortion, uh, aspects of cancer and this and that. They, they, the networks won't have it. In, in 1972, you're dealing with abortion, and as recently as a couple of years ago, The Family Guy couldn't air an episode about abortion. 
Were you, would, you, could, would you have guessed in 1972 that we would not have come that far? I, I, I would not have guessed that. And the same reason, you know, uh, when we did, there was two episodes on Moed. In, in the first uh, episode, she had the abortion, announced she was going to have the abortion. Second episode dealt with the results of that. So the, the, the nation didn't know the first episode was coming up. It just came up. It was on the air. Happily, uh, it, was, uh, it was on the air in, in, uh, uh, in the uh, winter or late fall. Uh, and there was absolutely no reaction of any serious consequence. I mean, uh, a, a network or a sponsor can make uh, a lot of mischief with 20, 30 letters, you know, that can horrify them. Right. Maybe they got them, maybe they didn't, I don't know. I, all I know is there was, there was nothing that happened. Uh, abortion was something families in America dealt with all the time. If it wasn't in their home, it was down the street, it was around the corner, but they, they dealt with it. And uh, by the time we went into reruns in April or May, the religious right knew we were, you know, in reruns, and, and they knew of the show, and now they could show, uh, you know, or use whatever power they had to block it. Yeah. And that's when all the noise happened. But America had taken it in stride. So we were, America was already ready for these topics that you were blazing oh, new trails my for. Oh, God, yes. Yeah. So w did you ever think of yourself in those times as being a provocateur or... Were you just telling the stories that you thought? I, I didn't already? know. No. We were all, you know, men and women with families, you know, struggling to make a living. And you got to remember that we were suppliers. Yeah. Ultimately, though I fought the network to get certain things on, there were sponsors there waiting for it because it rated. Right. So ultimately, you know, another way to, nobody looks at it this way, but it is the way commerce works. Supply and demand. So there was a certain latent demand for exactly what I was doing, or it wouldn't have happened. And I... I never said that before. <laughs> I hope somebody wrote that down. I think, it's <laughs> I think it's absolutely correct. We had a great chat last night, and uh, we had... We were, was that you? That was me. Oh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I had the fish, remember? You had the fish. Yeah. <laughs> um, it was great a... <laughs> But it was an interesting, you made a very interesting observation about how, that television today is mostly a product to sell products, um, like the way it was really when you got into your first, yeah. was your first TV job writing for Martin and Lewis or not? Uh, Jack Haley, Jack just Haley. before that, uh, and, uh, Dean and Jerry. And then television was blatantly that, right? Yeah. It was called the Colgate Comedy Hour, it was not, yeah. and then to, and, and today it's kind of come full circle to be much more um, driven around out selling advertising. Um, and in the middle there somewhere, where I don't think it could have happened at the beginning, and I don't know that it could happen now, you gave the medium a soul, a conscience, something to think about. <laughs> um, and you look, do, do, you, do you watch television today and feel that there's more of it or less of it or a need for that kind of exploration? Uh, I mean, there's some, I, for me, this is the golden age. Uh, it starts, uh, <laughs> the golden age is two reasons for being. The first one, uh, as treacly as it may sound, uh, it's the moment we're alive. This is, the, you know, this is it. That's golden. Yeah. Uh, but there were shows on the air that just stunned me. They were so brilliant. And uh, I don't have the time to see them. Yeah. I have friends whose, uh, you know, whose taste I trust, who just love this, that, and the other thing, but there may be eight or ten shows they feel that way about, <clears throat> and I can't see them all. Yeah. I, I will see a, an episode of one and understand totally how right they are, but I just don't find the time to see as much as, as I hear about it. Well, the, the one thing I will say that I was most amazed at the first time in your home is seeing this wall that I know is a small portion of your writing history. Oh, the script. All the script, these yeah. bounded script. But I look at that and think of most of the people who we talk, look at as today's, uh, you know, at the center of the golden age of television 
I've had one show, maybe two shows ever on the air. Yeah. Uh, and you had this string of hits, back to back to back, and spin-offs of your hits. I mean, spin-offs are something that barely happen anymore on television, and nearly every one of your shows had spin-offs. You even had a, a cult show, like Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman, that itself had a spin-off, right? A Fernwood Tonight. Uh -huh. A cult that spawned a cult. Um, well, <laughs> well, that was, again, a business thing. of the, the stations around the country that had made themselves an ad hoc Mary Hartman, that's the way they thought of themselves, independent stations, that had a hit show on a national level and uh, that wasn't from the network, it was independent. And they became known as the Mary Hartman Network. Right. Uh, they wanted something to follow Mary Hartman. And uh, you know, we, had, uh, we had found a star in, uh, in uh, what's his name? Uh, Martin, Martin Mull. Oh, Martin Mull, yeah. And so, uh, Fernando Tonight followed. So, but do, does everybody in this audience know what this man is up to? <laughs> I mean, we have thirty minutes. Is, Don't waste time on me. You've got Norman Lear's over here for crying out loud. You know, at one time it was uh, it was Milton Berle. It's Mr. Television today. Could be Ted Sarandos. <laughs> you know, truly. What about Netflix? What about what Netflix is doing and the sh and, and the ease and and cleverness, smartness, with which they just put things on the air because they believe in the, in the people who have created these shows. You know, the, the best part about it has been being able to support the, you know, the writers of these shows. And well, that's what's so glorious. The writing, I think, is at the core of this golden age, and at every golden age of television in history has always been the, the writing mm -hmm. at the core. So I, I uh, you, you um, I've told you this many times, but I've always been so deeply uh, in awe of your work and your life and your, the, your attitude, uh, your crossover of personal and professional life. Let's um, talk about doing something I've, uh, on your... Absolutely. We, we need to. We need to. <laughs> we, how about... Uh, You've got a show. How about people over 60? Well, <laughs> we, you know, it was an interesting. Some people have told me about House of Cards. Yeah. Um, that, that, that when they see it, they say, you know, this is finally something on television for grown-ups. Uh, doesn't have that, you know, it doesn't suffer from ads, so we can live, in some, we know it's not gonna get canceled in three weeks because we don't have to worry about selling Viagra as it gets it. So the, uh, <laughs> and when I look at those and say, you know, is there a big, obviously this is a big and growing audience. So, you know, we have a, we do have a show coming up next year um, called Grace and Frankie that uh, stars Jane Fonda and Lily Tomlin. Oh, uh, Martin, like that. yeah, yeah. Uh, Martin Sheen, Sam Watterson, the whole the whole cast is over seventy, I believe. So it's. <laughs> uh, so we're I, I I I gave him and everybody else a script three years ago, called "Guess Who Died," <laughs> <laughs> Ab about the, you know a uh, ten or so family members in a retirement home, with Charlie Sheen on the phone calling his aunt when he was in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, do you, uh, what are you, what are you watching these days? You... I'm uh, utterly taken with Transparent, and I think I'm watching one of the great performances of all time as Jeffrey Tambor struggles walking a line between hilarity and, uh, and, uh, and uh, heartbreak. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's fantastic. It's a great performance, absolutely. A great performance, yeah. great performance. So how many people know that? Is it, I mean, yeah. It's a small, you know, relatively small percentage of a room the way it is with so many great shows on Yeah, it. yeah. And then the, the idea that you could say that the, on the day after one of your shows, when the whole country would be talking about the same thing, but today I think this, it's similar in that you walk through a restaurant and the whole country's talking about what, was, what they watched last night. It just wasn't, the same, just wasn't necessarily the same thing. Yeah, it's yeah. Bill Cosby today. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to take you back to a couple other things. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, that one, no too well. No too well. So if I go uh, back to one of your other great television moments, we saw a second of it up there with your, your hosting duty on Saturday Night Live. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, how did that come about? And, and, uh, and I know you've got a great... You're, you're one well, of your... it, was a, it was a second year, and Lauren didn't know better. <laughs> <laughs> so he asked me to host the show. I don't think he ever had anybody like me on again. That is uh, somebody who wasn't a face non on, on yeah. the tube. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, 
there was an incident in, in, in that show. <laughs> I had uh, my daughter Kate uh, and I, when I was doing warm-ups for our shows, I did a lot of the warm-ups for uh, All in the Family, Maud and the, the Jeffersons and so forth. I got a kick out of talking to the audience. And I would uh, say I had a little joke to tell, a little a, a routine. I needed somebody in the audience and I would, uh, this child at five, six, seven raised her hand, I would bring her up. Well, it's my daughter, but nobody knew that. And I would say, we're, we're gonna pretend we meet her in the street. And you say this, I say this, you say this. You say this. And she made a mistake the first time. The audience laughs and I get angry. The next time there's another little mistake <clears throat> and I, I wind up yelling at her. And it's, <laughs> it's very funny on the one end, it scares the shit out of them on the other. So, uh, and then I would introduce my daughter and we would get a big, and Lauren, I saw that. That daughter was now 17 or so on her way to college. Right. And, uh, and he loved it. And so it was in the show. And as the, we were on live, this was absolutely up at eight or off at 9.30 or 11, off at 1.30, whatever the, uh, just before I was to go out, he came up to me and said, Norman, we have to cut three brothers. We're gonna go to the film. So I'm the host, I'm to walk out. I, would, I fully intended to walk out and do my producer's bidding. But in the second row, with the lights sufficient to see her as I can at this very moment. Not unlike right this moment, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> there is daughter Kate. And there's no way in the world I'm gonna cut that bit. <laughs> so I invite her up and we do the routine and Kate is here today. <laughs> Now, that, that beautiful act of fatherhood got you banned from Saturday Night Live for me. <laughs> no, I, You're on a very I, short list of people who are not invited back to Saturday Night Live, right? Uh, I, don't, I don't know if there's a list, but I know that. <laughs> you and I, I, I don't think I've ever seen a show when it wasn't somebody who was well known for being on camera. Right. I was an off-camera personality. Well, I, as, uh, I will have to give up some of this time to the audience because I know everyone would love to chat with you, so I'm gonna open it up to questions. Look how they want to chat. They want to chat, <laughs> right here. Hi, Norman, uh, Joe Marchese. So you talked about a lot of the programs that you did were doing bidding because there was demand and it would do ratings. Do you, do you think about any shows you might have made or what you might have done differently if you were making it for Netflix and there were no ratings required? Oh, that's a good question. I, I can't say I've uh, actively thought about that. I, aren't you nice? <laughs> <laughs> They're well lit now. <laughs> uh, yeah, I like that. Uh, I got a call from, uh, from Sony recently. They, we had sold our library to Sony some time ago. And they want to talk about the possibility of doing All in the Family 2015. Forget the bunkers, forget uh, the characters you know. Just do an all in a family kind of show about a family. Uh, they could be, they needn't be a, a Caucasian family, it could be a Latino family, but a family in, uh, in 2015. So for a week or less, it was only a few days ago I got this call, I've been thinking about that. That causes me to think, in answer to your question, uh, what we could do that I would elect to do uh, that we couldn't do then. Now, I'm not sure that there's much that I would elect to do that we couldn't have done then, because I don't recall any time when we couldn't do what we wanted to do. Just, just required more fighting. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But after a while, with success comes the ability to say, we're doing this. Right. Over here. Hi, my name is Jasan. Um, Good Times was one of my favorite 
shows. Um, I love Thelma Evans. <laughs> And um, I won't make this long, but one of my favorite episodes is when Thelma and her boyfriend get into an argument. He's been drinking, he's hiding the alcohol, and he says, well, you know, times are hard, and so I've been drinking. I'm paraphrasing. And she says, you know, well, you just have to keep trying. So I just wanted to take this opportunity to find out from you what maybe one or two of your favorite episodes of Good Times is. What was my favorite? Episode of Good Times. Of Good Times. There was an episode when, uh, I love the way these things started, too. Uh, you know, there was an I, uh, item in the paper. What we all did as writers was pay close attention to our families and what was happening with our kids in school and what they were hearing in their neighborhoods and, and uh, what was happening in the newspapers and how that was impacting us and so forth. And one day, somebody came in with a news item that uh, hypertension in black males was at some kind of all-time high, significantly higher than in white males. And that was an interesting, it, you know, provoked a conversation which resulted in, wouldn't that be a terrific story to follow with John Amos? And the fallout from that is when we did the show, uh, they got, the network got so many calls from African-American families across the country wanting information about that hypertension. And, uh, and when they did the reruns, uh, 180 different degree different story from Maud, they cut some commercials so that they could do some uh, PSA work uh, announcing what could be done if black males were interested in or their family's interest in pursuing the question further medically. Wow, it's pretty amazing. Now you, you had an episode famously that dealt with sexual assault. I mean, these were heavy uh, topics uh, for a sitcom, yeah. With Edith. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But on Good Times as well, right? On, uh, oh, we, yeah, yeah, that's right, on Good Times yeah. also. Both ends of the age spectrum in those two, in this, between All in the Family and Good Times. That's why the, uh, the rape story was written originally <clears throat> for Bonnie Franklin on One Day at a Time. And then there was a big story about a woman in her 70s, perhaps 80s, who had been raped. Yeah. And we thought, oh, to get away from the notion that it, it, it's always an attractive or that the right. woman has some, something to do with the reason she was raped. She was pretty, her skirt was too short, that kind of yeah. uh, nonsense. So we said, let's do it with Edith. Wow. And uh, it was a terrific, oh my God. That's an amazing piece The of biggest story. reaction I could ever remember from an audience is when she gets away from that rapist. Yeah, they explode. Uh, they, the audience yeah. explodes in applause. Yeah. Get a question so Norman, hi, it's Kay Koplovitz. I just wanted to ask you, when you started out in your career, was it, did you have people in the industry that, it's still a young industry, but did you have people that you looked up to in the industry in terms of what they were doing at the time, as forming your own shows? Well, I, yes, I did. I had uh, uh, Fred Allen, I don't know how many people now would remember Fred Allen on radio, <clears throat> was, uh, he's still a kind of god to me, I mean, he was just, Brilliant, I loved his sense. I learned a lot from, uh, from Fred Allen. I learned a lot from, uh, I, was at, I, I spent one year at Emerson College in Boston, uh, the home of, 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 of a part of the city called Scully Square, where a, a great burlesque house, the old Howard, existed. I saw a lot of burlesque, learned a, <laughs> learned a lot from those comedians and from the strippers. <laughs> well, they, in their own way, had a real sense of humor, and they played an audience. Their timing, a, 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 a stripper, the music playing just right, just a long sleeve. She, all she's doing is peeling a long sleeve, and she's holding an audience like, I hope I'm holding you now. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and amazing timing, amazing. There was, there was a lot to learn. And so, the foolishness of the human condition never 
was clearer, <laughs> brighter, <laughs> yes. more, more enlightening than it was in Berlin. <laughs> so I, I think I do what I do today because of my parents weren't paying attention and I watched way too much television when I was a kid. Were, were, were you, uh, did you do the same with, with, with radio? I mean, you're I Fred Allen was a yeah, great no, we, radio uh, comic. We listened to Jack, my father controlled the radio dial, as Archie did later with the television. <laughs> uh, but we listened to Fred Allen and we listened to Jack Benny and uh, we listened to Joe Penner, nobody remembers. Joe Penner was a big star in his day. Uh, so, we, no, we listened to a lot of comedy on the radio, Chasing Sanborn, our, you know, yeah. comics. But you, you came initially not to be, or not to work in television, right? But you, or not to be a writer for television, but... Yeah, no, I, uh, I, I had, I was a kid of the Depression. My father had gone to jail when I was nine years old, and I was pretty much alone. And uh, I had one uncle that every time I saw him, he flicked me a quarter. And he was my role model. I wanted to be an uncle who could flick a quarter to a nephew. <laughs> 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 if I, at 12, 13, if I had a goal in life, that was it. Let me flick a quarter, to be able to flick a quarter to a nephew. And there was a saying among the elderly uh, 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 Jews, my aunts and great aunts and uncles and so forth, Every, everybody was broke, very few were making a living, and, the way they put it was, so-and-so is a good provider. And to be a family guy and a good provider, that was it. Just, that was, so a, a, an uncle who could flick a quarter was a good provider. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have, uh, in your long and wonderful life, have, done, have taken being a good provider to new heights. Uh, and not just a provider for your family, uh, but a provider uh, to our country and to the world oh, okay. of great stories and great, uh, and, and uh, the ability to reflect on ourselves is a real gift. And, uh, and you have uh, taught us a lot and took us along, uh, along the way there. Thank so you. I couldn't appreciate more. Can, can we fun. close with what is playing on Netflix now? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll, I'll start with, a, well, I'll give you two quick ones because we, uh, we have a premiere tonight uh, here in New York of uh, Lilyhammer season three. Uh, and then our next big original series uh, starts December 12th called Marco Polo. And we're thrilled about it. And you're, I can't wait for you yeah. to see it. It's this big, gigantic show that we filmed in, uh, in Malaysia and Kazakhstan and Venice. Uh, about the uh, based on the historical fiction and based on and who, and who wrote and uh, directed it? Uh, it is. Um, oh, I'm, got, I'm all I'm all caught up in your stuff. I'm all caught up in your history today. <laughs> Nothing could be more encouraging to me. <laughs> Norman, thank you so much. You're welcome. This was all you today. So thank, thank you. you. So much. Thank you, thank you.